Oh, session five. Uh, what time are we getting to? What is it? One fifteen. Do you guys need a five minute break? Keep pushing. Okay, let's go for it. Okay. Now, if all you have is a hammer, everything st starts to look like what? A nail. That's why you can, I think you can never have too many ways to share the gospel. Uh, different situations require different uh, approaches, different personality. I, I have a humorous personality, so I use some humor when I share the gospel. That may not fit your personality, which is fine. You know, some people are just always dead serious, like Frank Knipe. He's just always so serious. <laughs> And, uh, <clears throat> okay, now the greatest tool that you have in your tackle box, and I'll talk about this tom tomorrow, is love. People respond to love. Uh, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. So the greatest tool you have is to love people into the kingdom, but you need to have the gospel along with that. Um, okay, let's talk about the story type methods. Uh, you don't need a pen and paper. Uh, it works in well in groups or with individuals. Uh, riddles is one of the ways. It's kind of a humorous way, and it may not fit your personality, and that's fine. Uh, Jesus used riddles, like in John 2.18. 2, he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it again. And they thought he was talking about the, the, the temple in Jerusalem but he was really referring to um, Zacharias chapter six, where it talks about the temple of the body. Uh, but you'll have to go back and read that sometime. They didn't get it, and he doesn't tell them the answer because he knew their hearts weren't ready to receive it. Even in the very beginning of the book, they're out to kill him. They hate this guy because he's disrupting their whole system of, uh, of order. They were top dogs, you know, in the kennel, and they didn't like him coming in, turning over the money changers and the tables and stuff. Um, one that I used quite a bit are, what are the five man-made things in heaven? Uh, maybe you've heard that one before. I, first time I used it was in uh, France. I was on a train. And um, I helped this lady, I could see a little bit back then, I helped this lady and her boyfriend get on the train, and they just got back from a six-month vacation in America. Only a European can take a six-month vacation in America. <laughs> and um, they weren't married, and I knew that. And uh, she asked me, we're sitting in kind of a cabin with, oh, maybe five or six other people, and we're all sitting in a circle kind of looking at each other, I'd never been in a train like that before. Usually they're just row to row back, you know, like a bus or something. But she asked me what I did for a living, and I just learned this riddle. And without thinking, I said, well, I tell riddles for a living. And she started to smile, and she's interpreting for everybody on the train in our cabin. <clears throat> and they all say, well, let's hear one of your riddles. And uh, I said, well, what are the five man-made things in heaven, for example? They couldn't guess what it is, and finally they said, well, we don't know, we give up, tell us what it is. And I, I'm, I'm trying to think, I don't want to give them the answer too soon, I want them to think about it, so I said, well, I've got a clue. Um, there's uh, five things in heaven that man made. <clears throat> uh, there's two pairs and one by itself. <clears throat> and they talked about it, and again, they said, we don't know the answer, so tell us. I said, no, no, we've got another hour before we get to the next train station. <laughs> <clears throat> well, they didn't like that. They want to know now. Uh, anyway, conversation kind of got around again to what do you really do for a living? I said, well, it has something to do with the riddle that you couldn't guess. And they said, well, give us another clue. And I thought about it, and I said, okay. Uh, two pairs, one by itself. All five were made by sharp, pointed objects. <clears throat> again, they could not guess the answer. And they said, tell us the answer. And I said, no, I'll tell you just before we get to the station. So we get close to the station. They said, okay, tell us the answer to the riddle. I said, well, I thought of another clue. <clears throat> uh, what are the five man-made things in heaven? Two pairs, one by itself, all made by sharp pointed objects. And all five were made for each of you and me. 
And they just said, look, we, have, we don't have the foggiest idea what you're talking about. <clears throat> I said, okay, it's the major wounds on the body of Christ. And they go, oh, wow. Two in his feet, two in his hands, and a spear hole in his side. And uh, I said, and there's more to the riddle. And Sabrina, she said, what more is there to the riddle? I said, well, the rest of the riddle is, what is God asking you to do with that message? that Christ died for your sins. And she said, are you saying we're bad people? Because Europeans, they don't think they're bad. <clears throat> I said, yeah, that's what I'm saying, that you're bad people. Me too, we're all bad people, we've all sinned. Kind of went through the plan of salvation. And right there on the train, she trusted in Christ. That is an anomaly. That rarely happens to somebody in Western Europe. So it's just one way, <clears throat> I could tell you story after story how I've used that. Now, another riddle that I use, <clears throat> excuse me for my throat, I'm really struggling here. I better take another sip. Is <clears throat> a female angel riddle. <clears throat> now you have to preface it and, and make sure they have a sense of humor. First time I used it, I used it in Russia. I went to see a, a blind people at a blind society, club or something. There's 40 Russians out there and we brought them some medicine and toothpaste and cassette tapes, all kinds of stuff. And uh, they wanted to know why I did all that. And I said, well, I just wanted an opportunity to share a riddle. And they said, a riddle? I mean, I really had their attention. And I said, yeah, what? I said, but you have to promise me you have a sense of humor. And the riddle is this. <clears throat> Uh, it's called the female angel riddle. Uh, God was concerned about the people here on earth. And so uh, he sent a female angel, which don't exist. I mean, all women are angels, right? Uh, <clears throat> but sent a female angel to earth to check on things, to see how people were doing on earth. And she made meticulous notes. You know how women are, very detailed usually. Wrote up a long report, and the short story of it is that when she gave it to God, the summary was uh, that people were really in trouble, that 95% of the people on earth were bad people. Only 5% were good. Well, this was alarming to God, so he decided he'd send a male angel down to double check her. The male angel goes down. <clears throat> he doesn't take many notes. He just kind of looks around, talks to people, comes back to heaven, and he says, God, the female angel was correct. 95% of those people down on earth are bad. Only 5% are good. And here's the riddle. God was very concerned when he heard that. So he wrote a letter to the 5% of the good people on earth. Now, do you know what he wrote to these 5% of the good people on earth? And they said, no, we don't know. Somebody said, the Bible? I said, no. I love you? I said, well, I was kind of in there, but no, that's not it either, really. <clears throat> and finally, they said, well, what was it? I said, well, didn't you get the letter? I got the letter. <clears throat> I said, oh, I bet it's in your mailbox. Yeah. And uh, they didn't get it at first. You know, sometimes humor just doesn't translate in a different culture. And it took them about five minutes, and then they started laughing. <clears throat> and then I shared with them that if God were to write a letter to the good people on earth, nobody would get one because none of us are good. It led right into the first point of the plan of salvation. Okay. Um, okay, and another one that I use are, what are three things God cannot do? And I preached this, I think, last time I was here, right? It's taken from John three sixteen, for God so loved the world. He can't love you more than he already does. He loves you with a perfect, eternal love. Uh, secondly, that he gave his one and only son. He cannot give you anything more precious than his one and only son who died for you and rose from the dead. And thirdly, he cannot make the plan of salvation any more simple, how a person gets to heaven. For whosoever believes, pistuo, trust in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. He can't make it any more simple, okay? That's the... Uh, three things God cannot do. I've used that effectively. Uh, just last January, we had over 1,300 come to faith in Christ. Uh, the previous year, we had over 2,000 in Kenya. 
uh, using that illustration among some of the others. <clears throat> it seems to really get their uh, attention. Now, listen and ask is another one. <clears throat> and Luke chapter 2, 46 and 47, we see Jesus asking questions. He asked over 300 questions in the New Testament. He was constantly asking people questions. So learn how to ask questions <clears throat> rather than tell people the truth. Lead them into the truth. Um, it's a very Eastern uh, method of sharing truth to ask questions. We as Americans like to be sometimes a little too direct. So if you can learn to ask questions, I think I have some other notes on there, so let me skip through that one a little bit. Workbook page 28. Uh, the background method is another way. Just ask people about their background. Show some interest, some genuine interest in people. Pe you know what people like to talk about? Themselves. themselves, yeah. So let them talk about themselves. You'll find out a lot of good stuff and maybe a, a little segue into a, a spiritual truth or sharing the gospel. Um, D, what is the greatest problem anybody could ever face? I've preached that in Ethiopia and various countries, and I get the crowd all stirred up because they don't give me the right answer. And one time they said, well, if you're so smart, tell us what the answer is, stupid. You know, they, they get kind of angry with me and say, well, I'll tell you, but it takes 20 minutes. And of course, the greatest problem anybody could ever face <clears throat> is what happens next? Where will you spend eternity? And it just leads right into preaching the gospel or sharing the gospel. And you could do that on a personal level. Ask somebody, what's the greatest problem that you face? You know, and really the greatest problem, if they're an unbeliever, is, uh, you know, hell. Okay, now I need a, oh, I think I've got a piece of paper. Does everybody have a blank piece of paper? John, did you pass out the paper? Okay, you, you'll get some now? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to deduct your pay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let me. The notes Pardon me? The blank notes well, you've got to have a regular sheet of paper. <clears throat> it takes me a while to get this done. But it's. Did I show this last time? No. Oh, okay. This has been a really effective tool for people who can see. You know, don't do it with blind people. But again, if a blind person can do it, guess what? You can do it. That's right. Okay, well, I'll, I'll kind of get mine started anyway. Is John back yet? You back, John? Okay, but this is what I used um, in the hospital in Nicaragua when those people from the emergency room came out, those 22 people. I passed out a piece of paper to everybody. We always keep a bunch of paper in the car with us now <clears throat> for this reason. So once everybody gets a piece of paper. Okay. In fact, uh, the last time I used it was in Nicaragua. I was sitting in a restaurant in a hotel, and my son, Jason, had led the owner to the Lord. And there was nobody else in the, the restaurant. It's not a big hotel. And I asked the owner if we could talk to Marbali, the waitress, for about 10 minutes. I said, I want your permission. I don't want to just, you know, make her sit down and talk to me if she doesn't want to or if you don't want her to. He said, yeah, yeah, sure, you can talk to her. So I had a piece of paper like this. Everybody got their paper? Was that a yes? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Hold it up vertically like this. Take the top right corner, fold it down so it looks kind of like a triangle. Make it real even to the left side. You got it? <clears throat> And so I had Marbley do this, or maybe I did it myself, I can't remember. I can't remember if she did it or not. Okay, then you take, you got that? Then you take the top left corner like this, and you fold it down to this side 
to kind of make the shape of a very symmetrical looking house like this, okay? So it's gotta be real even down here on this part here. <clears throat> you with me? Okay, you got the house? Okay, and you start off this way. You say now, um, uh, John chapter 14, one, Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. So God wants us to go to his house in heaven, but how do we get there? And then you go back to the first fold, this one here that looks like a triangle, and you say, now this is like the sail on a sailboat. Can you get to heaven by a sailboat? This is great for you to do with your kids or your grandkids. They'll, they'll enjoy doing this. They'll get a kick out of it. And they say, well, no, you can't get to heaven by a sailboat. I say, that's right. In the same way, you cannot get to heaven by being good because we've all done things wrong. Romans 3.23, Romans 14.1 says, there are none who are good, not even one. So being good isn't the way to heaven. So let's go back to the house again. Go back to the house. So again, how do we get to God's house in heaven? Now take the sides of the house and fold them together real even. Okay, so that the point of the roof is folded in half and the base of the house. This is my boarding pass, so it's already kind of pre-folded in a weird way, so. <clears throat> it should look like this. You got, does it look like that? Okay, now turn it on its side like this and fold the wings down. You're gonna make an airplane, but make them great big wings. They have to be really big wings and the body of the airplane has to be real even, about the, the size of your thumbnail. So you want great big wings. Okay, and then the body of the airplane. Now, some of you ladies are gonna have to help the man next to you. They probably weren't very good at paper folding and coloring. So somebody back there with Joe, give him some help or something. Okay, so you should have an airplane that looks kinda like this. Now don't throw it, guys. I know you guys, don't throw it. You, you got the airplane? Okay, then you ask them, now can you get to heaven by an airplane? And again, they usually say, no, you can't get to heaven by an airplane. You say, that's right. And you can't get to heaven by keeping the commandments or through a religion or through, uh, you know, being good. We've already said that. So you can't get to heaven that way either. So how does a person get to heaven? Well, open the wings up like that, go back to this position, point the airplane down, the nose down, and then very carefully tear the wings off right at the crease, okay? <clears throat> so that all you have left is the body of the airplane. <clears throat> now we're gonna do this tomorrow in church so you, you get to practice here a little bit. And you're left with what looks like a rocket, the body of the airplane. Does it look something like that? Kind of, okay. Now you ask them again. You say, can you get to heaven by a powerful rocket? Use the word powerful. And again, they'll say, well, I don't think so. Not to God's heaven, not to his house. No, you can't get to heaven by a powerful rocket. In the same way, you cannot get to heaven by powerfully committing your life to him or powerfully trying to serve him are powerfully doing anything in your own effort. It won't get you there. So what is the way to heaven? How do we get there? Well, very carefully unfold the rocket and maybe we'll see a clue. Very carefully. Okay, if you did it right, you should come up with a cross, okay? And uh, anyway. <laughs> It's a, you know, kids love it. But I've, I've had adults like it. Adults said, wow, that's, how'd you do that? And I said, well, so uh, that's another kind of show and tell kind of way that holds their attention. And you can tell them, hey, can I show you something a blind man taught me? And they'll go, what? I say, well, yeah, take this piece of paper and do what I say, you know? And uh, anyway, it's just a way to get the gospel out there in kind of a creative way. And when I did that, <clears throat> oh, I need my, oops, I need my hat. Is my hat up here, Frank? 
Do you see my hat somewhere? Yeah. Oh, can you bring that up to me? Sure. <clears throat> this is my hat trick. I'm going to pull a rabbit out of it. No. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, I showed that to, to Marbley, the waitress, and she said, well, I've never really sinned that much. I go, oh, okay, well, let me show you another one. So I use what I call the wallet illustration. You've all seen that, right? But I put a new wrinkle on it. Let this hand represent everybody here. Let my wallet repre represent things we've done wrong. The Bible calls that sin. You can turn over a new leaf, blah, blah, blah. It's too late, you've already sinned. God says he loves you, but he hates your sin because sin separates you from God just like my wallet separates my two hands. <clears throat> See, that's the problem. You have to really understand what the problem is before you can understand the good news, the solution. Now, if you died with your sins unforgiven, according to the Bible, you'll spend an eternity separated from God in a place known as hell. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Now, some people say, well, <clears throat> but I've done a lot of good things. Uh, so let my hat represent the good things we've done, okay? So you go up into heaven, and God says, uh, why should I let you come into heaven? And you say, God, look at all the good things I've done. I was in church regularly. I gave to the poor. I didn't uh, beat up my husband like Nancy did all the time. Uh, you know, I wasn't a big sinner like Joe. Who else can I pick on? Why <clears throat> And look at all the good stuff I did. And God says, well, you know, you have been pretty good. Uh, but wait a minute, what's underneath that? Uh-oh, I see some unforgiven sin. You're not allowed into heaven, okay? So you have to understand and appreciate the dilemma that you're in before you can really appreciate the good news. And the good news is this, let my right hand represent Jesus Christ. He came to earth, he lived a perfect life, he did not have to die. He chose to die, to pay for our sins. And then he rose from the dead. Isaiah 53, verse six says it this way, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. So Jesus Christ died in our place, he paid for our sins. And then on the third day, he rose from the dead, demonstrating that he was God, the Son of God, deity, and that he has authority to forgive sin. And he asked but one thing from you. He asked that if you will believe that Jesus, trust in him, that he died for your sins in your place and rose from the dead, he will give you the perfection you need to go to heaven someday. Not your perfection, but God's righteousness, God's perfection, which is the requirement for heaven. And... Uh, I said, Marbley, do you understand that now? She says, yeah, I understand. And I walked her through the plan of salvation with her eyes open, and right there she trusted in Christ. So I'm looking forward to seeing her next time I go back to Nicaragua, which will be May 16th. I hope to see her then and make sure she's doing okay. Okay, um, I did it to seven doctors in an orphanage in Russia one time and I, I wanted to show them a wallet illustration, and as soon as I said wallet, I had their attention. They all came out, led all of them to the Lord. That's the way to make a Christian orphanage. You go in and you lead all these unbelievers to the Lord. Okay, uh, Philippians 3, 9 is a simple thing. You just take a pen or a piece of paper and stick it in a Bible and quote, uh, Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes through God and is by faith and not from the law. Again, just contrasting how we are hidden in the righteousness of God. When he looks down and sees us, he doesn't see us, he sees us covered by the blood of the lamb. In fact, I can't remember, did I share last time what the Chinese word is for righteousness? Anybody here speak Mandarin or Cantonese? It's actually two characters. You know, it's pictorial language. It's a picture of a lamb on top, and then underneath it is the word me. That's the Chinese word for righteousness, covered by the blood. <clears throat> so when God looks down 
at us, he sees us covered by the blood, the lamb who came to take away the sins of the world, Jesus Christ. See, you got the wordless book, first used by Spurgeon and modified by a lot of different people. Um, they've got it uh, with soccer balls, um, with colors on it, all different kinds of techniques. I've used that before, but uh, I have some others. I mean, since I can't see colors, I'm not real good at it. <laughs> I'll leave that with you. Um, you can get the Ten Commandments on the internet stamped in very small letters on a penny. And it's been interesting, because I, I used to, I, I forgot to bring some with me, but, or give some to you. But you give it to somebody and say, if you're over 30, you can't read it. Forget it. So you give it to somebody if you're over 30 and say, can you read this? And if they're under 30, for whatever reason, it's a challenge. They want to read every word on this penny. <clears throat> it's real abbreviated. And then you ask them, well, have you kept the Ten Commandments? And more times than not, if they're an unbeliever, they go, oh, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. You say, well, what about, uh, oh, I forgot the order of them now. Is it the ninth that says, thou shalt not lie? No, thou shalt not steal? Well, anyway, whichever it is, I have to go back and refresh my memory. And for whatever reason, they think that's really bad. You know, you shouldn't steal. Uh, and then I'll say, well, <coughs> what about the, the, the eighth or the ninth, whichever it is, eighth or ninth? I said, have you ever lied? I said, well, everybody's told a lie. And I said, well, yeah, no, you just told one. You know, because we've all stolen something. At some point, everybody has. Whether it be credit that we didn't deserve, um, don't get me started on income tax um, or whatever, you know. Uh, so it's just another creative way, a tool that you can use. I think you can order them on the internet if you like that approach. I just haven't used it that much lately. I've got so many different ways. Then there's a short type, uh, do versus done. Sometimes if I know I don't have a lot of time and somebody asks me, what's the difference between you know, what you believe and other religions believe. I say, well, it's the difference between do versus done. And they go, well, what do you mean? I say, well, religions teach you have to do this and do this and do this. And then maybe if you're good enough, you'll get to heaven. But Jesus says when he died on the cross, it's finished. It's done. He paid the price. The only thing left for us is to trust in Christ who died for our sins and rose from the dead. Uh, in fact, quite often I will use three or four of these types of approaches in uh, just one encounter, evangelistic encounter. B, the three circles, just draw three circles, W, W plus G, and a G uh, is another uh, way to do it. Um, C, one verse type. Many times I'll quote John 3, 16, and I'll say, uh, you know, that whosoever believes and is good shall not perish, but have you, and I say, well, that's not what it says. I can't do that now because I'm blind, but uh, back when I could see, I would insert whatever it is they said you had to do um, and clarify and contrast. Contrast is a great way to make things clear, and we'll see that tomorrow in the sermon. So misquote a verse on purpose just to clarify that it's only by believing, trusting in Christ that a person is saved. Uh, workbook page 29, F, the elevator, um, sometimes, well, I used to carry some gospel tracts, but gospel tracts don't seem to work as well in America nowadays. Uh, in a lot of countries, man, the people, you start passing them out, everybody wants one because they just don't have that much reading material. They're very poor people. Um, but I used to say, you know, how far does this elevator go? And they go, well, to the ninth floor. I said, well, you know, you can go, you can go a lot higher. You want to read about it? And of course, if you're going down, it's the exact opposite. How low does this elevator go? Well, you can go a lot lower. You better read about it. And, you know, there's different ways that you can engage people. It's not the most effective way today. It used to be more effective back when people actually, you know, wanted to have some reading material. Um, sometimes people will, I'll tell people, well, you know, there's two ways, two kinds of people. Those who know they're going to heaven and those who don't know they're going to heaven, which are you? And that's uh, sometimes a way to clarify the grace of God. Uh, just a short little snippy, clever little answer, I guess. Roman numeral five. Um, 
fifth group, the written method, the bridge. You've probably all seen, seen that. I think it's in the What's Up With That booklet. Um, we've had some tracks printed, uh, Where Will You Spend Eternity, that gives a whole list of wrong ways and unclear terminology. And we're going to have some more printed, but like I said, tracks don't seem to work as well in America. Uh, maybe they were overused. Maybe Americans don't have a, a long attention span. And, you know, if you put up a video and it's longer than 30 seconds, people won't look at it. Uh, it's just uh, attention span. We're so inundated with so much in the world uh, that they tend to be less effective um, compared to overseas. Um, okay, let me move on. Roman numeral six. Uh, party first method. Uh, Luke 5, 27, where Levi throws a banquet. Uh, uh, neighborhood parties might be a possible way. You're, you may live on a cul-de-sac or a subdivision that has some kind of parties. Go to these things. You might encounter and find someone that is open and receptive to the gospel. Uh, some people have taken batteries door to door to change their uh, smoking alarms, their smoke alarms, fire alarms. Uh, they do it, uh, I forget what was it, uh, the, the time that daylight savings times changes. So, you know, every six months you should change out your batteries. Are they connected now into electricity mostly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so taking batteries may not work. These are somewhat dated, some of them. Um, number seven, Roman numeral seven. Seventh group. Your testimony is a powerful evangelistic tool. And those who are going to Nicaragua pay particular attention. Okay. Um, okay. Try to listen to your testimony through the ears of an unbeliever. And then ask yourself, would he understand what God expects him to do to have eternal life? Um, here's some tips. One, be creative if possible. I don't know if some of you have some creative juices left to you. Uh, two, don't glorify your sin. You know, you don't want to go into a lot of depth. So uh, three, be aware that no one can refute your testimony. Nobody can say, that didn't happen to you. Well, <laughs> you weren't there. You can't, no, so nobody can refute it. So you can be very bold. Uh, four, be able to give different link testimonies because certain situations you really don't have a lot of time. Uh, or they may be just bored, and you need to pick up on that and not, you know, bore people to death. Five, learn to use contrast. It's not by being good. It's not through religion. It's not through blah, blah, blah. It's simply trusting in Christ alone. Six, try to keep it simple. Uh, how was life before Christ? What were you trusting in before then? Uh, B, what were some of the circumstances that led you to trust in Christ? Uh, you might use one, um, what a person used to trust in. You know, maybe they thought they could go to church and they'd get them to heaven. Two, uh, exactly how they came to, to Christ, to trust in Christ. Three, uh, what you're now trusting in, make it clear that I'm, and now I'm trusting only in Jesus Christ. Uh, you might use one or two clear Bible verses, like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, or John 3, 16. Uh, and then see how life is different after trusting in Christ. Not that you're perfect. You still struggle, but you don't have to struggle alone. You have God there with you. Okay, now what? Uh, you need to memorize it, or at least uh, to some degree. It doesn't want to be, you know, canned, but you need to have a basic understanding, and you have to practice it a little bit so that when you have an opportunity, it's not like, oh, yeah, what was I supposed to say? <laughs> it's not a good time to struggle. Um, practice it with a friend. Maybe afterwards, after this seminar, you could practice. Uh, different versions are needed. Pray for opportunities. And uh, tips, on, tips on how to keep it really clear. One, emphasize the free gift of salvation. Include both death and the resurrection. Remember the two essential elements. 
avoid theological words as much as possible. Uh, Four, use clear wording, street language, keep the cookies on the bottom shelf. Five, use verses dealing with salvation, not Revelations 3.20 or verses that may be controversial or don't really fit. If you have some questions, you know, see me or somebody about that. Um, Okay. Session six, we better take a break.